1982's Liquid Sky is an art house experimental semi horror, semi rape exploitation, semi fashion montage flick that quite literally is the cinematic definition of. Nice video, shame about the song. Nice to get that one out of the way nice and early. I wish there was something more I could say about it than that, but in all honesty, even the director, Slava Zuckerman, has admitted that this film was definitely an attempt at style over substance. He wanted to make a film that conveyed more with images than it could with dialogue. And well, in some regards, he's definitely succeeded here. What we have is a nearly two hour long feature with one of the more stranger plots to feature on this channel. We predominantly follow Margaret, an honor student turned psychobiker junkie whore, who's shacked up in New York with her lesbian lover Adrian doing all the drugs and having all the sex, consensual or otherwise. Margaret's a nihilist in many regards, who claims that love is largely a myth, that sex is boring, and that drugs are simultaneously for losers, and the only reason she'll ever have sex with anyone. Though what she claims and what is actually the case are two relatively different things. Shortly thereafter we're introduced to Jimmy, an androgynous so-and-so who has a tremendous dislike of Margaret and a tremendous love for lots and lots of lovely drugs. He kind of appears and disappears throughout the film and it's not entirely clear what his intentions are other than he wants to have a good time and get loaded. So life is a drug fueled humptastic time for Adrian and Margaret until one day an alien spaceship about the size of a frisbee lands on the roof of their apartment. And that's when things stop being train spotters and start being weird. You see, it turns out that aliens in this film are tiny and quite possibly omnipotent beings who are addicted to heroin. We also have a tremendous hatred of a particular chemical that's released in the brain whenever someone uses heroin, and coincidentally that same chemical is also released in a human brain when someone reaches orgasm during sex. And you can pretty much piece together what happens next. Margaret ends up hooking up with someone in her apartment, he achieves orgasm, and the aliens kill him by jamming a massive glass shard into the back of his head. This happens a few times, and Margaret begins to believe that she has some kind of spiritual connection with Native Americans who are protecting her. And from there, the film kind of spirals out of control into a weird and at times depraved world of sex, drugs and fashion. Oh, and there's a man from West Berlin called Jorn who appears on the scene shortly after the first death, who may or may not be an alien himself, but is on the hunt for the alien spaceship, and also to find out as much as he can about the aliens in order to better understand their needs and requirements. He ends up staying at Jimmy's mum's apartment throughout the movie, whilst Jimmy's mum desperately tries to get into Jorn Schlupfer. I didn't so much hear about this film, more I was exposed to it a few months ago when the lead into a film I was in the process of reviewing at the time had some trailers at the beginning of it, and this was one of the trailers on the tape. They showed some shots from a nightclub scene near the end of the movie, and I honestly thought it was quite possibly one of the most early 80s things I'd ever seen in my life. Unfortunately, my memory wasn't very good, and when it came to making a note of the film's title, I accidentally ended up writing down Liquid Dreams instead of Liquid Sky, and subsequently I ended up with a trashy and slightly dull erotic sci-fi movie but I'll get to that one in good time. Now, it was last year's Friday the 13th free shipping sale courtesy of Vinegar Syndrome that enabled me to sit down and see this movie for the first time. And to be honest, when I found out that this film was a VS release, I did become a little bit concerned. You see, Vinegar Syndrome are probably best known for releasing vintage porn and super obscure horror movies but the emphasis is usually on the porn. 
So it kind of made me worried that this film that looked great as a trailer may indeed in fact be nothing more than arty pornography. I am, however, happy to say that while this film certainly does have a lot of sex in it, it's absolutely not graphic and there isn't so much as a nipple in sight through the entire picture. What there is, though, is a lot of rape. A hell of a lot of rape. It's hard to explain, really, exactly why this movie's settled on the amount of rape that it has, because one of the things you need to understand about this movie is it's incredibly woozy to watch. Almost dreamlike in places. The closest thing I could realistically compare this to is it feels a bit like Split meets Penetration Angst meets the cover of the 1977 David Bowie album, Low and that the three sort of got thrown into a pot with a sprinkling of... Nice video, shame about the song. And this is the result. Because of this, there are a lot of things that happen in the film that are open to interpretation. And in all honesty, there isn't really a tremendous amount of explanation or reasoning. Things just sort of happen. Only where Split felt like it was being manned by people who approached the filmmaking process with a proactive and regimented attitude, which as a result meant that they made a film that felt detailed, crafted, and ultimately was a pleasantly challenging watch, this feels a bit more impulsive. And because of that, it also feels a bit like it's freewheeling at times. I compare this movie to Split because, tonally, the two have a lot in common. They both utilised, at the time, quite modern effects, they both aren't tremendously dialogue-heavy, and they both have very distinct and unique visual styles. They're both also absolutely insane in places, and that isn't that much of an overstatement. To get it out of the way right away, this is probably one of the prettiest films I've ever seen. It's just beautiful. Almost every shot has a uniqueness about it, and it almost feels like every shot I'm watching could be a moving painting. I wouldn't be ashamed to have any frame of this movie on the wall in my house. And based on its looks alone, it's more than secured its place on my shelf of noteworthy films. From a cine standpoint, there's a tremendously good range of shot types. Experimentation is plentiful, and composition and visual effects are frankly stunning. I really can't stress just how interesting the visual effects are for the time. I mean, they aren't anything astoundingly impressive now, but given that this film was not a big budget feature and was made in 1982, there's some pretty cutting edge computer effects in this, which I really have to commend. It's very lively, and frankly the whole thing is just gorgeous. There's a fantastic use of colour as well, with orange bathed shots of the New York skyline contrasting with neon lit nightclubs, which only enhance the pure 80s vibe that this film gives off. The costumes look to have been tailored to match the colour palettes that this film was aiming for, but it goes further than that, because even the direction has a massive emphasis on wanting to visually tell the story rather than express it through the dialogue. And because of this, the cast are highly animate, which when coupled with that woozy, dreamlike vibe I mentioned earlier, and the colour choices, creates a totally endearing, if not slightly disjointed experience that from a purely visual standpoint, desperately needs to be seen by many, many more people. The script, however, well, that's kind of this film's downfall. There's two fundamental problems with it. First and foremost, what dialogue is written is a little bit too final year high school drama student for my taste. None of the dialogue free flows, and while I understand that that was kind of the intention, ultimately it was a style that isn't for me. It's all a bit too dry and awkwardly delivered, and given the plot is about tiny aliens who kill people who take heroin or boink, you'd think there'd be at least a little bit of self-awareness in here. But no. 
And the second problem is yawn. Now, while it is entirely possible for this film to have been made with no backstory or explanation, I do completely understand why the writers and director chose to add the backstory and exposition about the aliens into the mix. However, they've pretty much given all of that exposition to Yawn, which means his character literally only exists to pop in, set up what's going to happen in the next scene, and then pop out again. I'm really not exaggerating, quite literally a scene will open with Yawn going, these aliens are drawn to a chemical in heroin, and that same chemical is present when people have sex. It'll then cut to the next scene, which will be a sex scene in which someone gets killed. It's a ridiculously bad writing habit, and it means that Yawn as a character has no function other than to literally set up and explain anything that's a bit odd in the movie, and other than that, his only other function is to offer a very obvious and stale will-they-won't-they they with Jimmy's mum. As if to almost confirm this, and very mild spoilers ahead, so please skip about 10 to 20 seconds forward from now if you don't want to know how the movie ends, but in the final 10 minutes of the movie, they literally have him leave Jimmy's mum's apartment for the first time for no reason, and then they kill him off. No payoff, no grand reveal, no closure, it's just, right, he's done everything we need him to do, off he goes! It's unforgivable writing, honestly, and provides one of the weakest links to this film's armour. Because of this, I think it's very fair to say that this film is definitely a more style over substance production. As this is a bit more of an arty film, I usually will try to find a deeper meaning that this film has to offer. And honestly, I think this one was a little bit cleaner cut than some of the films I've sat through. To me, this film is about identity. It's about what makes someone who they are. Is it their surroundings, the people they're in contact with, their clothes, their politics? Throughout the film, we see a number of people who all question their identities, their place in the world, and ultimately what they want to be. Some people in this movie express themselves through the drugs they take. Others express themselves through their art. Margaret's probably the most interesting case in all of this, because through this film, we see her mainly as this nihilistic and crushed individual with a hopeful streak running in as an undercurrent through her. And what makes her character the most interesting is, just for brief flickers, we get to see her character before she decided to make the life choices she did. We see her growing up graduating, we see this hopeful and happy woman, and it directly contrasts with the character we ultimately end up with. I think this film's main aim is to ask the question, what makes us who we are? And can we actually physically change our character, or is it something that's ultimately out of our hands? I think the film gives the director's thoughts on this pretty clearly, but ultimately I'll leave it to you guys to draw your own decisions on exactly what is and isn't possible here. Finally, the soundtrack, and this was one of the elements that gave me an entirely different mindset of this film. This movie's score sounds like Earthbound. It's all MIDI keyboards all the way through. Does it sound good? God no. I mean, for a video game at the time, I'd have said this sounded pretty incredible. But for a music soundtrack? It's tinny, cheap sounding and repetitive without any real flair or insight. In fact, come to think of it, there are tiny aliens and a journey of self-discovery and identity in Earthbound as well. Not that I'm saying that Earthbound was inspired by Liquid Sky, I'm just saying, you decide. Liquid Sky was written and directed by Slava Zuckerman. The guy's directed about a dozen movies and has written about as many too. Nothing particularly of high note though. In honesty, after this movie, the next one he's probably best known for is that he directed the making of documentary for this film that's present on the Vinegar Syndrome Blu-ray release. So that's nice to know. The film was also partially written by Anne Carlyle and Nina Karova. Anne is semi-retired at this point, but starred in about a dozen or so movies, her last in 1990. She also plays Margaret in this movie. But on the writing front, both Anne and Nina only have one writing credit, this one. 
I'm fairly convinced that their contributions were maybe on set additions or ad libs, because in all honesty, based on what scripting I've seen, I don't think there was a lot of dialogue to write in the first place. I can't say that Liquid Sky is a particularly deep film, though it likes to think that it is. The only two things I took from this are that identity isn't necessarily something that's within your control, and that all men are absolute bastards who will rape you or try to mentally destroy you if they can. It achieves these two messages, however, in one of the clunkiest and ham-fisted ways that I have ever seen. But you know what? It looks damn fine whilst it's doing it. I think quite a few people would be easily tricked into thinking this was a good movie just based purely on how it looks. But in all honesty, while those visuals are incredibly impressive and distinctly interesting, the plot, gummed up with bad writing and an OST which left me real mixed feelings, holds this film back from being as good as it could potentially have been. Well, I'm sure there'll be some out there who'll disagree with me, and do feel free to discuss this movie with me, because there is a lot to talk about with this one. It's style over substance at its finest, and while I'm not normally one to endorse this kind of thing, it's just too pretty to throw away. Go and watch this one is my advice. It's not revolutionary, but it's certainly a visual treat.